We are back, and you're listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. Continent USA. If history is any guide, containment 2.0 may become another bloody debacle for the West. By pursuing a strategy that is both brutal and underhanded, the West is likely to undermine the very values it is attempting to promote. For insight into this, let's turn to our next guest. He's an author, independent journalist, political analyst, and reporter for RT, Caleb Moppin. As always, Caleb, welcome back. Sure. Glad to be here, as always. So the piece continues. There's an interesting line between Bergman, uh, Kimmage, Mankoff and Senkovaya's articles, The uh, America's New Twilight Struggle with Russia, in which the authors talk of checking Russian influence in Central Asia and Africa. The distance between the U.S. and Kazakhstan is about 6,500 miles. The distance between Russia and Kazakhstan is zero, as the two are neighbors. Yet, for some strange reason, it is considered quite natural that the U.S. should seek to dominate a region 6,500 miles from its shores, where, whereas Russian influence right on its own borders is deemed a threat that must somehow be contained. And your thoughts on this, Caleb, because this is not only a matter of Russia and Kazakhstan, it's a matter of China and Taiwan. I mean, we can pick a number of of regional conflicts that the United States is flaming, and we could ask ourselves the same question. Kayla Moppin. Yeah, well, this article was reflecting on the Truman era, I guess the Truman Doctrine policy of containment uh, Mm -hmm. that defined the opening years of the Cold War. The idea was to stop the spread of communism at all costs. Uh, This was the era where they had talk of the domino theory uh, that if we don't fight them on the Korean Peninsula and we don't fight them in Vietnam, they'll soon be uh, invading the United States. And so uh, it's this life and death struggle between the West and its ideals and communism, the Red Menace. Um, what's interesting about reflecting on that era is one of the biggest components of containment uh, was the very authoritarian uh, military dictatorships and regimes the USA had to prop up in order to beat back uh, the spread of communism. And as containment continued during the 1950s, it became apparent that the only way these authoritarian regimes could remain in power uh, was through allowing them to engage in economic development. And part of what defined Kennedy and the way that things began to shift in the 1960s was there was a big effort on the part of the Kennedy and later Johnson administrations to work with figures like the Shah of Iran uh, or the military dictator of South Korea, Park Chung-hee, to industrialize their country in order to stabilize the authoritarian governments uh, that, that were being propped up as a barrier against communism. And when we look at today, what's very interesting is a lot of the figures uh, that were propped up by the United States as anti-communist, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these military leaders and such, are now the very people that want to do business with Russia. Uh, because Russia will give them a better deal, and China the same. China will also give them a better deal. And a lot of the military forces in Africa, the military leaders that want to do business with Russia, the new president of Indonesia, who is much more friendly to Russia, these are people whose roots are in the anti-communist, nationalistic military forces that the United States propped up during the Cold War, uh, but at first allowed to engage in economic development. But as we saw in the late 80s, and especially in the 1990s, Uh, The USA was not going to tolerate economic development on these countries' parts, even if they were anti-communist. With the Soviet Union gone, there was a a feeling that that the economic development that these leaders, uh, Manuel Noriega in Panama is an example, uh, the economic development they had engaged in uh, was too expensive for the United States, cut into the American monopoly. And we saw some of these very leaders the United States installed uh, and propped up and uh, enabled to industrialize on the basis of their anti-communism being removed. So it's a very strange development. Uh, The George Soros color revolution apparatus uh, is now a primary vehicle that almost sets U.S. foreign policy, and they want chaos. Uh, They don't want stability. So talk of containment, right, stopping countries from moving into Russia's camp, stopping countries from establishing trade relations with China and and joining the the BRICS and the rising alternatives. 
I don't know how this is going to work because a big part of containment was development. And it seems like the folks running the U.S. foreign policy are folks that don't believe in development. And the leaders who want to develop are pivoting closer to Russia and China these days. Well, you know, one of the interesting things when we talk about uh, uh, cont- uh, traditionally talk about containment, we talk about foreign policy. But, you know, uh, as I'm sure you're very well aware, a big part of containment was domestic policy as um, in, you know, people in the United States rose up who were wanted a different um, economic model. There were people who were uh, who were doing um, something perfectly protected under the Constitution, which was advocating for socialism. Um, our government was violating the Constitution by practicing a containment strategy at home and never been. And they, they haven't even tried to hide it. Your thoughts, Caleb? Well, sure. At the beginning of the Cold War, you had a really big crackdown and the FBI moving in to just crush the Communist Party. Um, But the U.S. government noticed that among certain sections of the population, intellectuals, students, and among the black community, there still remained a lot of sympathy for communism. So you had eventually the rise of the civil rights movement, which began with, you know, non-communist leaders uh, who took up a cause that communists had rallied around, which was black liberation, right? And you had the civil rights movement, which was very much the Democratic Party, uh, the Kennedy family, the United Auto Workers Union, and others kind of sponsoring the Montgomery bus boycott and the Freedom School over the South. And that was an effort to say, hey, if somebody doesn't talk about civil rights, the communists will. Uh, So it's better they get it from us. But then we saw what eventually happened, which was by the late 60s, uh, many of those very people who'd been energized by the civil rights movement in the hopes that that would prevent them from becoming communists became sympathizers with the Black Panthers and with the Black Liberation Movement and the Republic of New Africa. And you saw uh, a layer of black activists becoming sympathetic to communism. Uh, So it it didn't exactly work that way either. And it was like a game of catch up, uh, you know, that, that they're always trying to crush Anybody that that would have dissident sentiments in the United States, uh, trying to channel them in a direction where they can be useful to the power structure of this country rather than aligning with forces around the world that are opposing imperialism. But at the end of the day, as those forces mature politically and get involved in a confrontation with the power structure, they're going to realize that they've got better friends around the world than they do in the American deep state. And it's a very, very strange way of doing things. Right now, I, I look at what's being done to the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru movement. Uh, this is a group of black activists that have been indicted by the federal government uh, for allegedly being Russian agents. And I mean, this is like a flashback to the 1950s when the U.S. Department of Justice labeled the Civil Rights Congress as a subversive organization and passed a special law forbidding them uh, from putting up bail for any prisoner who was arrested uh, and and, you know, went after uh, many people like Claudia Jones and Paul Robeson, uh, basically alleging that the Civil Rights Congress and the people that were opposing the use of the death penalty against people like Willie McGee, a very famous case in the South, uh, claiming that those folks were Russian agents and stripping them of their rights and their ability to carry out a legitimate legal defense in American courtrooms. Uh, this is a similar thing. They're trying to claim that the Uhuru movement are Russian agents, so therefore their activism in St. Petersburg, Florida, and in St. Louis, Missouri, is somehow a Russian conspiracy. Um, You know, it's a story of the U.S. government trying to contain dissent and control dissent, uh, but failing to do so and running back to the drawing board and constantly readjusting their methods. And I'll just throw in another one was at the 68 Summer Olympics uh, when they labeled John Carlos and Tommy Smith's black fist gloves as the black power salute, wherein when in fact it was actually supporting the Olympic project for human rights. And that would, by, by changing the label, they were able to, to diminish the significance uh, of the, uh, of, uh, of the protest. Uh, there's a, there's a, another interesting piece in, Pearls and irritation, morally damaged, damaged America still wagging its righteous finger. Caleb Moppin. Well, indeed, because the main way that U.S. foreign policy is being sold 
in our time. Uh, as we are told, that various leaders around the world are violating the rights of LGBT people, violating the rights of women, uh, that they are engaging in crimes against humanity, violating people's rights, and that America is not a nationalist country. America is not, uh, you know, an imperialist power, but rather the United States is just so concerned about human rights and that we just believe in freedom and democracy and the rights of oppressed groups. Uh, that's why we are motivated to hate countries like Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, etc. Um, however, uh, you'll notice that there's been a big break in that narrative because anyone who's at all concerned about human rights, even if they get taken in with, with some of the deceptions that are used against various countries, can see that what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, I mean, this nonstop, round-the-clock bombing of Gaza that has gone on since October uh, is a huge violation of any notion of human rights and decency. So we have many people that have been trained by this human rights propaganda apparatus saying, okay, you know, I, I, un, I, I might buy some of the other things you say, but I can't buy what Israel's doing, and going out and protesting. Um, and we have, you know, the so-called left uh, that has been cultivated and used for, you know, human humanitarian intervention propaganda. We see them out in the streets denouncing Israel, and we see the Biden administration almost trying to get some credit for that while they fund Israel, while they give Israel a blank check to do whatever it wants. They still want credit with Arab Americans. They still want credit with dissident communities of somehow being on their side against the Republicans that seem to be more solidly behind Israel. And it's a very, very confusing moment, right? The United States that has backed all kinds of murderous regimes around the world, that has engaged in horrendous bombing, that destroyed Iraq uh, based on the lies of weapons of mass destruction, destroyed, destroyed Libya, the most prosperous country on the African continent, and bombed it into rubble with what we now find out were lies about Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. Um, it has no moral pretense to be lecturing the world about human rights. But even utilizing that strategy in their propaganda has backfired at this point. Um, uh, and again, this is kind of like what we were discussing before about containment on a domestic level, trying to control the narrative and then running back to the drawing board and then trying to control the narrative a new way, uh, they're scrambling, and it, and it seems like whatever they do, they can't get over the fact that the emperor has no clothes, and people are seeing that there is blatant you know, imperialism and a desire for economic hegemony behind U.S. actions, and that's very hard to conceal. You know, I think a, an important part of it, to go back to the domestic end of that, is a big a, a part of to be, being able to uh, push the imperialism around the world is to lie to the American people and to say, we're going around, you know, liberal intervention in, interventionalism. We're going around the world to do good things. And then they all, so, you know, therefore the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, what was it, rainbow flags at U.S. embassies around the world and Black Lives Matter flags at U.S. embassies around the world as though, hey, we're there for to do good things for the oppressed population. I think that Israel is causing the same thing at home where the people here in America are no longer trusting that the U.S. foreign policy is out for liberal interventionism. Your thoughts? Well, I, I, I would agree with you. Um, and it's just whatever they say just continues to fall down like a house of cards. What I do find a bit disturbing is that in the Trump camp, on the one hand, you find a lot of people that say, look, the government works for an elite. Uh, these wars are not to our benefit. Uh, and I find that to be inspiring. But there's also a troubling trend that I do hear among some of the Trump crowd, which is they will say things like, well, why didn't we steal Iraq's oil after we invade it? And it's almost like they're they're arguing that the USA isn't really imperialistic, but it should be. Uh, and that is a very disturbing trend, but it may be, you know, like what they talk about, the last refuge of a scoundrel. Uh, it may be, I mean, when Donald Trump gets up and says, we're going to keep selling Saudi Arabia weapons because we want to make money from it, uh, because if we don't sell them the weapons, uh, the Russians might, and, and then we would lose the money. Uh, and, and I see almost this, uh, this attempt to, to blatantly sell imperialism in economic terms and try to convince the public that somehow they will be the beneficiaries of such a thing. Um, it, it almost sounds like a last resort argument. It's not a very strong one because America is getting poorer while weapons manufacturers get richer. America is getting poorer while oil giants uh, reap the huge profits and benefits. So, uh, but when I see when I see that tone of argument from Republicans, it's certainly disconcerting. But it shows that they've already lost the uh, the moral high ground argument to some degree. So, can I take away from what you've just said, uh, Caleb, that that the weapons sales 
is not a jobs program for the United States? Is that is that my takeaway from that? Well, it might have been a little bit during the Cold War, but nowadays <laughs> weapons are, are made by robots. You know, they're made by robots, not not by people. Uh, you know, I mean, with automation, I mean, it's at, you know, they're not hiring all kinds of unemployed and underemployed working people to go and stand in the factory and make bombs and tanks and missiles. I mean, that may have been what happened during the Second World War, and they talk about war rejuvenating the economy, but that's not the case in Middle America right now. And you know, opening up a new front of global confrontation is not going to rejuvenate the U.S. economy. If that was the case, that would have happened about 10 times already. Caleb Moppin, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Caleb. Folks, you are listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon. I'm joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. There's more on the other side. Stay tuned. 